Okay. Hello, so everybody. I'm happy to see you and to hear you probably later in the discussion. And it's very nice to be here, actually. Uh, Barbara and I, we plan to go to Dresden. And uh, I announced that there will be no hotel. But unfortunately, Dresden, they don't welcome any more tourists. You know, So instead of sleeping under a bridge, we decided to stay at home which is very unfortunate when you think about what um, yeah, Corona or COVID does to us. But anyway, I'm happy to be here. And I will start with uh, an episode, actually. In 1987, I was uh, associate professor at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And uh, I was introduced to a new colleague. And this new colleague um, was in introduced to me as Peter Scott, as an Englishman who is perfect in Danish. And the story is, of course, that my colleagues always wanted that I learn some Danish. And there is this kind of uh, miracle, you know, person who really I could see, you know, and I could hear that he is very fluent in Danish. Now, it, uh, it took me a week to find out that, in fact, Peter Scott is Danish, and he did his, uh, well, sort of master's exam at the University of Aarhus, and uh, so it, but his English was so perfect. I mean, that is, you know, it was really nice British English, because uh, for after his exam, he was also visiting many months, actually, probably years, along his school of economics and so, and then he came to Denmark to Aarhus as associate professor and we were colleagues. But after we, I sorted it out, you know, that then there was no alienation anymore. And actually we spent many, many hours in a coffee place called England in Aarhus. Uh, we worked to 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the evening and then we met there for one or two beers. So, uh, well, we discussed a lot. And we had to discuss a lot because I was interested in game theory and microeconomics. And Peter is a real macroeconomist. I mean, he is one, you know, who deals with the Keynesian notions, you know, of macroeconomics, which GDP, investment, macroeconomic investment, you know, and um, consumption, of course, and savings and so. And um, well, oh, it was quite interesting because it was clear that we we do in a way different things, you know. But then the period, and now when it come actually, well, about still personal data, I left uh, uh, Aarhus in 2000, no, in 1991 actually, 86, 91 for Hamburg, and Peter stayed there. Uh, after I have to mention that we were both promoted actually while we were there to a social professor with special qualification. Now the story is of course uh, Peter was highly qualified. My qualification was still that I didn't speak any Danish. So I mean that's okay. Then I left in two, uh, in 1991 for Hamburg, and Peter stayed there up to 2003. Uh, he had many visiting professorships somewhere, you know, but in 2003, he, so to say, finally got his call, you know, he's, uh, he wanted to go there to University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Now the university, and he's still there, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst is, uh, well, it's a place for radical. Economics. I mean, that when you go around in the States, you know, they all think, well, half of the people you meet in academics, they think they are all communists there. Some think they are socialists, and not too many think they are very decent uh, economists. <laughs> but anyway, so this is the university actually where um, Sam Bowles was, um, Herbert Gintis, and Peter is, so to say, is the successor of Sam Bowles in a way. But Peter is doing macroeconomics, and uh, he's doing a kind of macroeconomics who was uh, for a while dying out, you know, because there was this idea about micro foundation of uh, macroeconomics. 
uh, there's a book, I remember, a collection of papers, which was very prominent for this idea by Edmund Phelps. And uh, Edmund Phelps was visiting München several times. So I met him before I went to Denmark and we had, uh, well, I couldn't say discussions, but he was preaching this, you know, and Edmund Phelps was preaching that macroeconomics has to have a fundament, which is on uh, optimization, individual decision-making, goal orientation, and so on. And not just writing down Y and C and I and all this. Uh, I didn't say much to this because, I mean, I was very little at that time and uh, there was this big Edmund Phelps and I didn't dare to, to challenge him. But uh, coming from microeconomics, you know, I realized, you know, um, if you have this one, well, these micro foundation models, they have in general one decision maker, the representative, representative agent, and this decision maker, he maximizes a, a utility function of Cobb Douglas type. Either it's a, yeah, it's a utility function or a production function or whatever, but there's one agent. And I was doing models, you know, where we had two agents and in game theory. And then I realized already that I have problems to, hmm, to find out what the two agents are doing. You know, if they're in the chicken game, you know, three equilibria, one mixed, everything can happen, you know. So how should I dare, you know, uh, to uh, have this micro foundation well, it works well, you know, if you have a Robinson Crusoe on our island, but as soon as um, the second guy comes in, we call him Freitag, then uh, there might be troubles. And if you have three people, then coalition formation starts and all that. So in other words, if you do serious microeconomics and you, then how can you accept his microeconomic foundations? Uh, and you know, in this, Reader by Phelps, there are articles where A, this person, you know, the one, the representative agent, lives wherever, you know, well, no problem. And uh, he knows everything or she knows everything and all this kind of thing. And uh, this is not serious microeconomics. So I was always a very hesitant. And the more I was hesitant about this micro foundation, I love Peter's work, you know, because he is serious about macroeconomics, about these aggregates. But that doesn't mean, you know, that we should uh, accept everything for a consumption function or for an investment function in macroeconomics. There has to be, well, kind of behavioral assumption, perhaps, you know, kind of reasoning. But we cannot really derive it, you know, from a, well, micro model unless we have assumed perfect uh, uh, competition or something kind of strange things, you know, but not from a behavioral thing. And macroeconomics seem to be interested in behavioral issues. Well, not behavioral issues, but in, let's say in real world, big things. So, um, yeah. So Peter is doing the big things. And I think uh, today we, uh, hear more about these big things. So welcome, Peter, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. And thanks for thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks, Manfred. Thanks for this um, um, lovely introduction. I have very fond memories of our late night beers at Cafe England and other places. Um, it was it was a fun time. Um, I think I've lost some of my British. Um, accents uh, since I came here. Now it's probably some um, mid-Atlantic or something, but uh, you'll have to bear with that. Um, let me just um, add before, I am a, a, a macro uh, economist primarily as, uh, as, uh, Manfred, as Manfred said. Um, I do believe, however, that if we want to do good macro uh, economics, uh, we do need to take uh, behavioral issues um, very seriously. And uh, my problem with uh, what has become the, the mainstream really is that I think they fail to take the behavioral uh, 
uh, stories seriously and instead present something that is very far removed from what we observe in in real life. I also think they fail to take into account a lot of institutional and structural features that are um, very important. So the the motivation behind this this um, this project, uh, which is becoming a book, um, it's getting more and more real. Uh, in fact, I have to deliver the final manuscript by by the first of April, and I think that's realistic. Um, so this is this is an attempt uh, to set up a kind of coherent alternative. Um, I think a lot of people uh, feel that contemporary macro is is in crisis that is not really doing as well as it should i think the financial crisis was part of what sparked that view um, and i i hope that um, in some sense uh, uh, now people are ready to uh, maybe also look at uh, another theoretical approach uh, and not just um, retreat into pure uh, empirical work which i think there's a little bit of tendency uh, to, um, uh, at the moment, a lot of young people in macro seem to be doing that. So um, basically, um, the problem is, in my view, that current orthodoxy um, has a micro foundation that is just not very sound, and also that uh, it's a theory that is applied universally with no or only minor adjustments for structural differences between different economies. Now, I was struggling a little bit with um, how to try to <clears throat> present this today because it's, I mean, it's not a, a fat book compared to some of the recent tomes that come out. Piketty is uh, beating me by several lengths and so are other people. But it's still a, a, a book that covers a lot of a lot of uh, topics. So what I thought I would do would be first to go through a, an example that kind of illustrates, it seems to me, both the importance of uh, the behavioral elements and of the structural elements that I want to emphasize. And in the book, this is just a very small part. Um, so towards the end, I, I want to I hope there will be time for me to just talk a little bit more broadly about, about um, how um, uh, these same themes uh, actually occur in, in other areas as well. Um, but what I will be talking about mainly today is inflation in developing economies. And I think, I think there are some real puzzles uh, in that from the point of view of, of uh, the contemporary orthodoxy. And uh, so that's what I want to address. I'll first talk a little about distributional conflict and norms of fairness. I'll then talk about <clears throat> endogeneity of norms. I'll then talk a little bit about dual versus mature economies. That's sort of the, the structural aspect, if you want. Then I don't think I'll go through the details of the model, but I do have the equations if anybody wants to see it. Uh, a simple two-sector model. And I will then... Um, in that emphasize a little bit the, the, the specification of weight setting and, and norms and that part and that will then lead to a, a discussion of the implications as an example uh, of um, how I believe this is actually despite its simplicity quite a, a relevant way of looking at things I may talk a little bit about um, what has been happening in many developing countries during the commodity boom of the early 2000s, um, when these uh, economies used um, orthodox policy prescriptions, balanced budgets, and inflation targeting, how that led to really bad outcomes. Um, and then conclusions, where I will try to also say a little bit about how the same themes of behavioral and structuralist elements uh, resurface in many other areas. It's not just vis-a-vis -vis developing economies. Most of the book is, is not about developing economies. It's just that I, given my perspective, I also um, try to point out in a couple of places how our standard macro models may need modification, 
if we want to apply them to to um, countries that are quite different in some ways. So to get started, um, there's this uh, lovely poem that you may have seen. I don't know. I actually didn't read uh, Matthewson, who was a sociologist. The original study of workplace is from 1930. This is the second edition. Um, and um, I, I picked it up from a paper by Akalov and Yellen. But here's a little part of the poem. And it says, I'm working with the feeling that the company is stealing 50 pennies from my pocket every day. But for every single penny, they will lose 10 times as many by the speed that I'm producing, I dare say. For it makes one so disgusted that my speed shall be adjusted so that never more my brow will drip with sweat. It expresses in quite, in quite neat way the fact that if workers feel that they're not treated well, that they're not being treated fairly, then there are ways in which they can reciprocate, they can retaliate. And one obvious way without direct sabotage um, is to just slow down to just not work as hard, as diligently in the interest of the firm. This notion that in labor markets and wage formation, fairness is important, of course, is not new. I mean, this quote was from back from the 1930s before people had, had formalized efficiency wage theories. But if you go back to even Keynes's general theory, to take a classic example, Keynes is talking about how uh, wages may be sticky in nominal terms. Why? Well, the behavioral argument is that although workers might not object to a reduction in their real wage, if it happens through an increase in prices, which would hit everybody the same way, they might be ferociously opposed to a reduction in their own wage which would mean a reduction in their relative wage. That would be grossly unfair. They care about these relativities. Um, Kahneman and co-authors, well-known paper from 1986, talk about where, uh, fairness, both in, in pricing actually and in labor markets, and, uh, and uh, discuss how, how um, fairness, uh, if it's not achieved, uh, leads to to disgruntled workers, and uh, and there's evidence for that. Oaken, for that matter, Arthur Oaken, uh, talked about how in, in wage formation, um, the invisible handshake was much more prominent than the invisible hand. Um, labor relations were were governed in part by these notions of fairness. And uh, Truman Bewley, in a couple of um, wonderful um, Contributions, a big book from 99, there was a paper from 98, uh, talks uh, about, based on extensive interviews with um, wage setters, how um, fairness is enormously important and that explains a lot of what's going on. For instance, the reluctance of firms to, to cut wages in recessions. Now, this is all old hat um, in some ways. And it has been formalized. Akalov and Yellen formalized some of these stories in the model of, of fair wages. Um, story is very simple, really. If you, if you have a, a, a wage that must be at least equal to the fair wage, otherwise workers are going to withdraw effort. And if the fair wage depends on norms, but is also dependent on the unemployment rate, which makes sense, and that's also what comes out of out of uh, empirical um, studies. Then um, we have a wage setting equation like this, and if you combine that with a with a uh, whoops with a standard kind of demand for labor or price setting equation, you're all set to get a really a version of a natural rate of unemployment now. Uh, with uh, fairness as the efficiency wage element rather than a Shapiro-Stiglitz kind of, you have 
you have selfish preferences and, and standard intertemporal optimization. But in terms of conclusion, it's really very similar to other, other efficiency wage models. The interesting bit in that story comes more when, when they disaggregate and look at, 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 uh, at the wage distributions and where they can def derive really what amounts to a natural distribution of income. The problem with that, it seemed to me, I, I, I love the paper and I have a lot of very interesting kind of, uh, as you'd expect from Akhalov, uh, empirical evidence and he refers to literature and Shakespeare and whatnot to bolster these claims about fairness. But what is missing is this um, also old insight that norms of fairness, of course, are not just constant over time and God-given. They change endogenously. Hicks said that quite clearly in his, in his book on the crisis in Keynesian economics, that the system of wages should be well established because then it gets the sanction of custom. It becomes what is expected and admittedly on a low level of fairness, what is expected is fair. I think that's a very important insight. Um, if, if something has existed for a long time, then, then uh, we don't question it anymore. It's not just Hicks. And again, this has a long history. Marx talked about historical and moral elements in the value of labor power. What is that other than kind of, you have something that is changing over time, some fairness norm, some, some moral element. Marshall talks about how, how um, workers should be paid in a way so that they can um, live in a way that to which they are accustomed. Keynes has another quote where he says, past events have led to wage rates being customary and usual, and that's, that's why they are what they are. And again, of course, recent behavioral um, economics has, um, has uh, documented that or, or emphasized that and bolstered it with, with, um, with uh, uh, experiments and with, with uh, psychological, I don't know, in-depth interviews, whatever they do. But there's a lot of also experimental evidence uh, that, that suggests that, uh, that uh, in, fact, in fact, we adapt and that stable state of affairs become accepted eventually. Uh, here's a quote from Kahneman. Now, the question is, what are the implications of these, these uh, fairness? This is the behavioral element. What are, what are the implications of that for macro? Um, and there, I think it's important to make a distinction between what I call, I picked it up from Nicholas Caldo, I think, what I call mature economies. What are mature economies? Well, they're economies that in some sense are relatively close to something like full employment. What it means is that if you had Chinese style growth rates of 10% a year, then it wouldn't last very long before you would have severe labor shortages and inflation would be spiking. In that sense, Economies like the German, the French, the American, the Japanese, most, most rich OECD countries are mature. In these economies, the official employment rate, unemployment rate, uh, it's not a perfect measure, there's all kinds of weaknesses, but it still says something about the state of the labor market and the state of the labor market is an important influence on weight setting and does play a role in inflationary processes. For these economists, one sector models, at least for some purposes, may be plausible, reasonable, an approximation that is perfectly adequate for many purposes, not all. In these, in these models, what are the implications of endogenous norms of fairness in weight setting? Well, the implications are, I believe, 
that you tend to get employment hysteresis, there would be no natural rate of unemployment. You may also get distributional hysteresis. You can get wage inequality widening, and then once it's widened, then it becomes accepted. CEOs in the US um, for the top companies used to get in the order of magnitude 20 times as much of it as, their, as the average pay of their workers. And then between 1970 and now, it's, it's risen from this, this already very high 20-fold uh, premium to a ratio that's more like uh, 250, 300 to one. That has created a lot of, a lot of uh, maybe objections and people think inequality is a problem. But I think at the same time, there's been a, a creep upwards in what might be seen as acceptable. To say it ought to go back to a 20 to one would by certainly the CEOs, but probably many other people be seen as, okay, that's pretty radical, right? We've become accustomed to something that is very different than what it was. The norm has changed. Why does that lead to employment hysteresis? Well, you can illustrate it very easily in a simple diagram. Put employment, the employment rate on one axis. Let's assume we have a price setting curve. For simplicity, I'll, I'll draw it as a, as a horizontal line here with the real wage on the vertical axis that corresponds to constant returns to scale and a fixed markup. You could make it uh, downward sloping if you wanted, or you could do um, other things. It doesn't really matter. I think this is a good first approximation. Then have your weight setting. The fair wage depends on employment. And you would then have the Akerlof type um, natural rate of employment or natural rate of unemployment coming out of it. But now imagine that you had policymakers that increased employment, aggregate demand policy, okay? So what is said in the labor market is the nominal wage. So with the high employment, workers demand and get a higher nominal wage. They believe they're gonna get this real wage, but of course with markup pricing, they only get that. So if they're unhappy, and we can now get potentially the, the explosive inflationary process that Friedman and others introduced, the expectations of Mensit Phillips curve. But we will also get, as long as we have, we have the actual real wage being here rather than there, the norms will gradually be changing. The fair wage will adjust towards what we've been used to. And so the fair wage equation would be shifting down. And at some point, this becomes the new natural rate. Not a natural rate, but it becomes the, the rate at which inflation expectations are being met. Along the way, we may have had inflation going up, but it's not gonna be completely explosive. Norms adjust. The fair wage is not something that is set in stone. Now, what does that mean for developing economies? And here's the puzzle that kind of motivated this, 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 uh, this discussion for me. You see in developing economies, you see large amounts of underemployment. You see large sexual differences. The underemployed workers in the informal sectors, many of them have skills that are comparable to those who work in formal sectors. They're no worse. They could be there. Instead, they're left out in the informal sector at much lower income levels. Formal sector jobs pay better and they're seen as highly attractive. These are stylized facts. And I think they're widely recognized by people who actually look at them. And you don't need to travel a lot in India or in Mexico before you realize that when the Indian official unemployment rate is less than 5%, I think it went up during COVID. But if you look at pre-COVID, uh, 
when Indian unemployment is, is basically lower than it is in, in um, other OECD countries. In OECD countries, India is not an OECD country. The same for Mexico. So you have these, these official unemployment rates that are pretty meaningless. You have large, very large numbers who are in informal sectors and are in jobs that are very much less attractive. They would love to get formal sector jobs. Despite that, you actually have episodes in developing economies of inflation. They typically have higher inflation than, than the rich countries. And you have numerous episodes of hyperinflation or very high inflation, not least in Latin America. People have tried to estimate standard new Keynesian Phillips curves, and I mean, they fare badly in, in the rich countries, but they fare even worse, of course, when they apply to Brazil. That's not surprising. Does it matter? whether it's 35 or 45% of all workers who are underemployed, does that really matter for wage formation in the, in the formal sector? Is that, is that change, are these marginal changes in, in, even if we measured it correctly, are these marginal changes in underemployment, are they really what might be driving the, the, uh, the wage formation in the, in the modern sectors? But if they're not, what are the sources of inflation? Why do we get this, these, uh, these uh, hyperinflation or high inflation stories? And so the purpose of this is to embed a story of inflation in a model that captures differences between the modern or the formal and the informal sectors. And that also tries to, to uh, embed some of the behavioral um, insights that we have uh, into this framework. And then in that framework, examine what happens when you apply the sort of standard macroeconomic policy prescriptions, when you apply those prescriptions to developing economies. So I'm not gonna go through these equations. I have them, maybe I shouldn't even put up the slide. Um, the, the basic two sector model uh, is one that assumes you have a formal sector that employs both capital and labor. The formal sector, for simplicity, there's a fixed markup and the profit share is constant. The um, modern sector produces a good that can be used either for consumption or investment. Then you have a, an informal sector the informal sector is where workers who don't get a formal sector job go. In that sector, no capital is being used. That's just the stylized version of the facts. Capital intensity is much lower in the informal sector. For simplicity, no capital. For simplicity, all is wage income. There are informal small sector firms that make, make a profit, but leave that out. Pure consumption good being produced there, and there will be underemployment if it is a developing economy. If it's not, if there's no underemployment, it's not a dual economy, it's not a developing economy in my terms. What else do I assume? Well, I assume that the demand structure is such that, uh, that uh, workers uh, spend all their income for a developing economy, that's not unreasonable. Workers spend their income on consumption and they split consumption in fixed proportion, consumption expenditure and fixed proportions between informal sector goods and formal sector goods. If you want, that's a Cub Douglas utility function. If you, um, the, for simplicity, again, in this model, that's not important. I'll assume that, that profits are being saved um, and that uh, the, uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, consumption structure, the, 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 uh, the two goods, the informal good is only a consumption good and the, the uh, formal good can be used both for consumption and investment. 
So with this, we have two sectors. So we have two equilibrium conditions. Output of the informal sector good has to be equal to consumption of informal sector goods. And the, the output of the formal sector good has to be equal to consumption of the formal sector good plus investment that depends on, on demand and it depends on the interest rate and on the existing capital stock. Now, the key implication of this two sector model for my present purposes is simply that the, the relative, I call it relative wage here, it really is in the informal sector, it need not be a wage, it's the income, the average income of worker of a worker in the informal sector. A worker in the informal sector could be a street vendor. So it's not an employment, it's not a wage, but street vendors have an average income. They may be standing in the street trying to sell whatever they're selling, whether it's food or, or knitwear or whatever. They may be standing there a full work day, but of course, most of the time, they're just waiting for customers. There are too many of them and too few customers, so they're underemployed. But there's an average income in the in informal sector. And I look at this ratio of informal sector average incomes to the wage in the formal sector. This ratio is now, given my assumption, determined in a very simple way. It's determined by the split of the labor force between the formal sector and then the ones who are forced into the informal sector because they don't get a formal sector job. And then this term here is just the, the proportion of income of workers that is being spent on informal sector goods and formal sector goods. So workers split. I mean, the intuition behind the story is simply that, that workers in the informal sector partly consume their own good, but they also consume a modern sector good. So what happens is that you get, in a sense, the modern sector workers who are the consumers of the informal sector good as well. That this modern sector worker consumption becomes the autonomous demand for the informal sector. And you get a sort of multiplier relation. If you hire more workers and they get more income, then that has a multiplier effect on informal sector incomes. By the same token, if the wages in the formal sector go up, then a fraction of that increased income, nominal income, is being spent on informal sector goods, and that means average income in the informal sector will also go up. The equation is important. I'll use um, omega here. That's just a, a, a short hand for this, for this, the share of workers who are in the modern sector. The equation is important because what it tells us is that, is that the informal sector incomes are endogenously determined. If we boost the modern sector, then informal sector incomes are going to go up. Okay. Turning now to wage formation and inflation. I'll assume that formal sector wages, there is a target or a fair wage that is proportional to informal sector average incomes, a relative wage kind of. It's a norm. It's not something that is always necessarily the same. I'll introduce that later. But for now, it's a, it's a relative wage norm in exactly the same way that Akalov and Yellen had relative wage form uh, norms in their in their discussion of of um, wage wage uh, uh, inequality in the paper from 1990. I assume that nominal wages adjust. You are not always necessarily at the norm because you are setting nominal wages, and then you do that based on expectations about about what is going to happen to, whoops, to the incomes, the growth rate of incomes in the, in the um, informal sector. My hats, I think it's standard notation, are growth rates. So this is the, the growth rate of nominal 
wages in the in, in the modern sector in the formal sector depending on on uh, deviations of the target the fare from the actual you're trying to catch up and then you have here an expectations term what do we expect is going to happen to nominal incomes in the informal sector it's sort of a, a standard expectations augmented phillips curve but just just placed in this in this slightly different context where it's relative incomes and the norm for relative incomes that uh, is the the driver what happens to inflation well i won't discuss this equation in great detail but but you can actually embed a story you can embed this in a story that has some plausibility that actual actual aggregate inflation is related to inflation in the modern sector and of course if you have simple markup a constant profit share then that's related to what's happening to nominal wage income in the modern sector and productivity growth which is my q hat if we take q hat as given then basically inflation is determined by what happens to modern sector wages. Now introduce inflation targeting. That's the standard, the standard recommendation from the Washington uh, uh, organizations, IMF, uh, etc. And that is what is actually being pursued in, in most of many if not most uh, developing economies let me also consider medium run long run situations where expectations are being met so my expected the expected growth in in informal sector incomes corresponds to what is actually happening it's now easy to to see that with this assumption we must get to a situation where the actual uh, relative wage is equal to that dictated by the norm. And given that I had a relationship between between relative incomes and the the um, the uh, share of the modern sector, that means I've also pinned down now the share of workers who will go into the modern sector. I have effectively here a natural rate of underemployment and a natural rate of inequality. This is the parallel to what Akerlof and Yellen were doing in 1990, but just embedded here in a two-sector framework. Now let me introduce my behavioral modifications to the model. And these are twofold. I've talked about endogenous norms. The endogenous norms, it's easy to introduce those. A very simple, formal way of doing that is just to say that my parameter mu, mu was the, the, the norm for the, for the uh, uh, relative wage in the modern sector. But this adjusts gradually towards the actual relative wage that's just a simple graph i showed you earlier the gradual adjustments if the relative wage is above the norm then that tends to lead to an increase in the norm simple simple or maybe again intuitive story maybe i should have talked more about that um, if, if if you've been getting 25 dollars an hour and then all of a sudden the boss says hey we decided that you're actually a very valuable person we'll pay you 30. then it won't take the average person, certainly me, long to feel that, yeah, I'm, I'm worth 30. But definitely, I'm, that's, that's, that's not unfair. So if the boss comes back two years later and says, well, oh, actually, I made a mistake. You're going back to 25. That, that was fair, as you know. You're going to feel, no, this is grossly unfair. We've adjusted our, our, our notion of what is fair. And this is precisely what is what is described here, this gradual adjustment of the norm towards towards what has been actually uh, the achieved. So that's one 
element. The other element is is to use the terminology uh, introduced by by Bob Rothorn of all people uh, back in a paper from 1977. It's a distinction between anticipated and expected inflation. Now. Um, a wonderful paper by uh, Schaefer and some co-authors from uh, it was in 1997 called Money Illusion. It was in the Quarterly Journal. Um, they they talk about how most of us think not purely in real terms or purely in nominal terms. We sort of have both uh, both both frames in our mind, but the context in which we're operating influences which becomes more salient and particularly if we are in a in a context where inflation is relatively low then you would expect to see the nominal frame becoming more salient the one that starts dominating this is something that here going back to Bewley's wonderful studies something that he finds um, of course evidence for in the real world uh, here's a quote from his um, his paper. It's from uh, from uh, the where was it from European Economic Journal, I believe, um, where he's talking about how gradual reductions in real wages are feasible. Why are they feasible? Well, because a slow decline in living standards caused by a pay freeze. So you don't want to reduce nominal wages, but but you can freeze wages. And then gradually the real wage is being eroded, and that's not as noticeable. It's more tolerable as long as it's gradual and slow. Now, a way to embed that is to is to in the model is to say instead of having the wage inflation in the in the modern sector being determined by the expected growth in in um, in uh, nominal incomes in the informal sector, it becomes now a function F. This function I've depicted on the, in the graph here, if inflation is very low, if expected inflation is very low, then we don't really take it into account. So this we forget. Now it's nominal, that's salient, that's what we pay attention to. We're not really thinking about what's happening to, to, to changes. And then as we move to a more and more inflationary environment, we start shifting more and more towards maybe thinking in real terms. And at some point in this simple formalization, we are back to X rather than F of X, or putting it differently, F of X, is equal to zero maybe for for uh, for x less than zero, and then it is equal to x for very large values of inflation. But in between, we have this this convex kind of specification. I mentioned Rothorn. Rothorn introduced this in a one-sector framework. His model was slightly simpler. He says he says up until the threshold, we don't think about inflation at all. And then at the threshold, we jump and we think only about, about the, the real term, so inflation is fully incorporated. That's a little bit extreme, so I, I modified it here, but basically it's Rothorn's idea. Once we do that, once I've introduced my, my, my two modifications, then there is no longer a natural rate of underemployment in this model. Instead, what we get is that the target rate of inflation, remember we have economies that have been told they should pursue inflation targeting, but now the value of the target rate of inflation affects the long run growth rate. Growth is perfectly possible for a developing economy. They can transition towards maturity at a high level of income and with low sexual differences. But it has to happen slowly, gradually, so that a norms adjust. What we have is that if the inflation target is set equal to zero, then there can be no change. 
then we are back at, at, at the natural rate of underemployment. If we allow inflation to be too high, then again, inflation expectations are fully embedded in wage formation. And again, we cannot have any, any uh, growth in, in, uh, in the modern sector. Remember my sigma, uh, my, my, my omega is the share of the modern sector employment in this economy. But if we pick an inflation target that is sort of in this range below zero and K, whatever K may be 10%, uh, then all of a sudden we would get a possibility of sustained long run growth where we gradually move people from the informal sector into the, into the formal sector. I've here picked in this diagram, I've picked a, a particular growth rate, delta, I'm keeping that constant. So I'm looking at a stylized path where growth takes place at a constant rate and it's a rate that's sufficiently low so that it actually is feasible here. Um, so delta is some relatively, well, is it small? It could be, it could be 5%, 10%, even in the case of China. But it, it's, 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 it's a, a sustainable, given the structure of the economy, it's a sustainable growth rate. The fact that, that it's sustainable, that the inflation, the associated inflation lies between zero and K means that we'll get two stationary points in this phase diagram for X and the, whoops, and the term here, which really is, a, is an indication of deviations of of the relative wage from the norm. If this deviates from one, then we are away from the norm. As long as we are in this low window of, of, uh, of, uh, of inflation rates, there'll be two, two uh, stationary points. And here is the, the stable one uh, that, that we can, we can happily move along and even if there's a small shock we'll come back to it but what's interesting is that if in this situation if we're here if we get a large shock to the economy a large boost to demand for informal sector goods and that means that we get a large shift up here so let's say we shift up to this point then all of a sudden the dynamics will now not take us back to the equilibrium, but instead would lead to ever larger inflation rates. We would get a spike of hyperinflation potentially, unless the economy, unless uh, uh, policymakers step in and introduce contractionary policies. Now, what does all of this tell us? Well, it tells us, I think, as a general story that yes, um, developing economies like India, or they're, they're not doomed to forever being being um, being dual economies with a lot of underemployment. But if if relative wage norms are important for for wage setting, then they have to be very careful about not introducing large shifts, large sudden shifts in in relative incomes because that can produce sparks of inflation that can be destructive. Is that something we've seen? Well, I mentioned the commodity boom that affected a lot of economies, including particular Latin American economies. You had from 2002 to, uh, to 2010 or 2008, you had this enormous increase in commodity prices. Many Latin American economies have large commodity exports, rely on commodity exports. Now that gave a big windfall income to these economies. It also gave windfall tax, tax revenues. Policymakers allowed this 
in many cases for good reasons. You had Lula in, in Brazil who spent some of that revenue trying to reduce inequality and, uh, and, and improve conditions for the poor. Great, but you have to be a little bit careful because what happened was that you got a significant rise in informal sector incomes as a result of this. They were staying within standard recommendations. They were not running budget deficits. They were very responsible according to stand, standard uh, recommendations. But of course, a significant rise in informal sector incomes. Via relative wage norms, that led to inflationary pressures, which are clear, clear when you look at the data. What happened was contractionary monetary policy. What that led to was a real exchange rate appreciation. The tradable sector, the modern sector, became increasingly uncompetitive. We got a squeeze on the modern tradable sector. And when the, uh, when the boom collapsed, Brazil were left with a, a de-industrial, not completely de-industrialized economy, but certainly an economy that was in a worse place structurally than it had been before the boom. I have some graphs here, but I think I'm going to skip them, but just to illustrate the shift that took place in Brazil towards the non-tradable sector during this commodity boom. Now, what are my, my, my conclusions here? My conclusions is that, is that if we want to understand inflationary episodes and inflation in developing economies, then the standard new Keynesian Phillips curve is of no use. What we need to look at instead is, is behavioral and structural evidence, and that includes conflict inflation, but the conflict to a large extent being over, over relative income norms, which if they are violated, can lead to, um, to strong inflationary pressures. We need to embed this story in a multi-sectoral model, we cannot, for developing economies, just treat the whole economy as if it's a modern sector. That's not the way it is. Once we do that, we see that there are no sort of insuperable long-run constraints on structural transformation of developing economies, but conventional macroeconomic policy prescriptions can generate Volatility in real exchange rates, it can generate deindustrialization and have very unhappy consequences. And the commodity boom, I think, illustrates um, those, those possibilities. Okay, I think, I think Manfred took some of my time, so if you bear with me, I'll say just a few words about how I think this is not an isolated example of um, contemporary macroeconomics. Um, ignoring important behavioral and structural uh, uh, parts. So behavioral economics, that's become quite, uh, quite popular, it's, uh, in, in, it's certainly in micro, um, but I think at the same time there is at, some, at least some view that, that the behavioral economics insights are at best kind of minor modifications on our existing story. I mean, I have a quote here from Leifson and List. It's from the American Economic Review from Papers and Proceedings, I think 2016, where they say, oh, well, I mean, traditional microeconomics will actually take us a long way. Here illustrated by, if you want to go from Chicago to Fenway Park and watch the Boston Red Sox, then Traditional economics will take you all the way to Boston University, which is right next to Fenway. And then you can use behavioral economics to, to find your seat in the bleachers. Right? So basically, the big picture is correct. We don't, I mean, it, it's important. We can refine our story, but it doesn't add that much. Now, I think that's completely wrong in terms of macroeconomics. And I'm talking macroeconomics here. So what I'm looking for is not just minor deviations, sort of random deviations from what the perfect, uh, perfect optimization story is telling us. I think the, the, the inflation in developing economies illustrates that. 
you, know, you may not buy my story, but certainly if, if, if you do buy it, then I think it has very radical implications, both for how we, we perceive inflation and for what policy recommendations we give. But it's not the only example. Let me take another example. Let me look at uh, the traditional mature economy. Central to macroeconomics is the question of consumption and saving. People save, they save, uh, and we, they're intertemporally optimizing, we're told. Um, but are we, really, are we really happy to believe that retirement saving can be understood in terms of sort of basically perfect foresight rational expectation story? We see a lot of, I mean, certainly the American data, we see a lot of Americans arriving at retirement age and discovering they haven't saved very much or anything. Is that consistent? Is, the, is, the, is what we see consistent with that story? And can we tell, say, okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like, like with ice cream. I mean, you figure out which flavor you like, you'll just learn, even if you're not perfectly optimizing ex ante, you, you'll figure it out. Well, if we're talking retirement saving, I mean, what are you telling me that that when we get to retirement and we discover that we haven't saved much, uh, saved enough, then in our next life we'll save more. I mean, the learning story, the traditional story that sort of says these small uh, deviations don't really matter; they'll get ironed out. And in any in any case, once we look at macro, they they average out. I think is fundamentally wrong. I think we have evidence of present bias. We have evidence that nudging matters. We have evidence that, that people are strongly influenced in their consumption by their peers. There's a lot of behavioral evidence. And it clearly is macroeconomically significant. It leads to systematic deviations from the benchmark Euler equation in your DSGE model. It just doesn't capture what's going on. What about institutional aspects? Well, I have a, a, um, a quote here from Lucas, which, I mean, he says, conventions and institutions do not simply come out of the blue. Right? They don't arbitrarily impose themselves on agents. On the contrary, they are designed to aid in matching preferences and opportunities satisfactorily. I don't know which planet he's coming from. This, this quote, it seems to me, is wrong on so many levels. I mean, whose preferences are being matched? Do all have the same? Do all agree on what would be good? Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's just mind-boggling. But stay with, with the uh, saving example. Do we believe that the corporate sector, which dominates the rich countries, that what the corporations do in terms of retained earnings or other aspects of their corporate uh, financial behavior, um, buybacks, uh, stock buybacks, etc., that this is irrelevant for aggregate outcomes and in particular for aggregate saving and consumption? Do we believe is that behavioral evidence that a good benchmark model will have Households own the capital goods, which is what the benchmark DSGE models do, and then rent them to firms. And that basically, it makes no difference. It makes no difference to aggregate saving what, um, how much corporations say retain earnings. It makes no difference because households will just will just see through the corporate veil, right? And once they've seen through the corporate veil, they'll adjust their own saving. Is that, is that a good story? It doesn't fit the empirical evidence. The empirical evidence say that, that, that corporate earnings actually and, and corporate retained earnings does influence saving. And yet this is a story that we, that we put into our, into our macro models. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. I think the, the behavioral and the structural aspects are important in all kinds of ways. And so what this, this book that I mentioned, what I what that is trying to do is to, 
is to pursue some of these themes and do it basically across several themes that are standard macro, so consumption and saving, labor markets, and then uh, macroeconomic dynamics, endogenous cycles, uh, policy making. Um, and I guess my argument is that uh, that the current orthodoxy is uh, is just uh, ripe for replacement. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I've spoken too long, uh, but uh, I hope at least I've given a bit of a flavor of what I'm trying to do. Uh, you may. You may not find it convincing, but there it is. So, Manfred, do you want to go through the discussion? I'm fascinated, Peter. I'm fascinated, but uh, I think we just continue what we have done 30 years ago or something like that. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I think you're, you're a great macroeconomist, you know, and I got real insights. Uh, my problem is, uh, what can we contribute as microeconomists? You know, of course, we have also stories about behavior, and uh, no, there's Ken Binmore here, and he's of course somebody who is about learning and all that. You know, and yeah, we we think there are rational choices, but it's on, yeah, it's basically on individual levels. You know, you know whether I'm a rational decision maker or whether I'm learning or whether I take uh, kind of norms. Um, it's a mixture of that. But I agree with you, you know, that on the macro, macro level, we have to think in different terms, actually. So I, I really appreciate your, your, your approach to that. You know? so, so the discussion is open, I would say, you know, and I have not to contribute too much now. But I, if just stepping very quickly to say, I mean, maybe, maybe I, I, maybe it didn't become clear that in fact, in fact, I believe that the micro is very important. I believe game theory has something very important to tell us as well, for that matter. I think a lot of, a lot of these uh, these macro issues they can be raised in terms of collective action games, whether it's investment saving or not. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not against against the, the goal orientation. I think that's an important element. What I'm saying is just that, that we need to also take the deviations that we do observe, take them very seriously. And I think they have macroeconomic implications. So it's not a it's not an argument against against goal orientation. That's why my, my heterodox mm -hmm. friends uh, often dislike what I'm doing because they feel I'm paying far too much attention to what is happening at, at micro levels. Um, so so if I gave the impression that I, I wanted to just do macro without without looking at behavioral evidence and without drawing on the tools from 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 micro then then uh, I failed. Uh, yeah. No Peter that's not my argument actually. Oh. Uh, the okay. thing is microeconomics uh, is very doing with a very complex issue and there's no ready-made which we can deliver just to macroeconomics. I think this kind of um, rational, what well, this micro foundation people, they think, you know, there is something in microeconomics which we can take and then put it into macroeconomics. Yeah. But we, we know from microeconomics, we, we do this kind of, we do research and we go on researching because we don't, we don't have results you know which just can put somewhere in some boxes you know there's a lot of things out there you know we have to analyze you know in microeconomics so it's it's not that i can so to say deliver results to macroeconomics huh? so you you your behavioral stories you know which you use um they don't have to relate to the latest microeconomics really because there's a lot of evidence without that. And that's fine. It's fine with me. Hmm? Okay, you're waiting for me. I, I want to um, speak, uh, disagree with Manfred a bit, because I think microeconomics is useful to you. Um, you don't have to convince me that uh, fairness norms matter uh, in wage bargaining. <laughs> 
I think the evidence is overwhelming. And there's not only um, uh, <clears throat> psychological evidence, uh, there's um, uh, micro evidence on how it works. Um, and where it would be useful for you to look, I think, is um, into what psychologists call modern equity theory. It's not very modern because they say modern to distinguish it from Aristotle. And um, <laughs> uh, it gives no attention at all from behavioral economists. Uh, so when you say behavioral, if you mean behavioral economists are not very supportive. But there's a huge psychology literature which is largely ignored by economists. Um, the only economist I know who took seriously modern equity theory was Reinhard Zelt. Um, so he has stuff that you would un understand. Um, uh, where I did disagree was when you quoted Lucas. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, you disagree with Lucas, uh, and I want to disagree with Lucas too. In his word, design. Uh, these these norms are not designed by anybody. These norms are they evolve, and what we need to do if we're going to try to incorporate behavioral norms um, is we, we really need to study the uh, evolution of norms in in simple settings. Um, so yeah, have you got really got more support than you know? Um, it's not the old fashioned neoclassical folk that those, those days I think are gone. Um, but um, the study of the evolution of norms isn't getting the attention it deserves. And I know I'm a bit, because I've written books on the evolution of fairness norms, which nobody takes any notice of. Um, so I would love to see it develop. Anyway, I, I would just try to say something supportive. I hope it's useful. Uh, uh, it's very interesting, Peter. Um, uh, in my understanding of um, uh, the problem raised by Keynes, or one of the key problems, is the problem of aggregate uncertainty, which leads to the failure of of markets to uh, to uh, equilibrate. As when, for example, in the middle of a recession. Uh, despite the existence of excess supply of labor, um, business firms are not about to invest because they just don't see the prospect that they can make any money by doing so. And so um, you have a, a, a lack of what Keynes called effective demands. My question is, how does, have you considered how um, at the macroeconomic level in that sense, um, uh, uncertainty and relative wage uh, relative wage targets, if we can put it that way, interact to, to determine the nature of macroeconomic failure. Have you considered this interaction between uncertainty and relative wage uh, theories? Thanks, Ken. I mean, I, I, I hate to say I haven't actually read your book on the evolution of norms. Maybe I should look it up. Uh, I think I think you're you're right that that in in some ways I have a lot of support and I'm very happy about that. I think I think there is a lot of movement in in, in parts of economics that's going my way, as it were. Um, but I think if one looks at at contemporary macro, then it seems to be still stuck. In in something that I find uh, uh, utterly unconvincing. I mean, uh, and I see a lot of movements in terms of of empirical work in macroeconomics, whether it's uh, I don't know Mian and Sufi looking at, at financial aspects or it's uh, whatever it is. I see a lot of a lot of empirical work that is that is quite quite interesting. But either it's not related in any way to to theory, or or when when uh, people try to relate it, they still feel a need to go back and relate it to DSG type models. 
And so in that sense, I think, I think uh, the field, the macro field is, is, is ripe for a, a change of, of paradigm, as it were. And I think, I mean, the, the sort of Lucas detour uh, should come to an end. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, um, more support than I think, I think you're right. Uh, I, I'm not sure why you didn't, why you might like the, uh, the Lucas quote. I'm not, I'm not, I do not mean to suggest that norms don't evolve and we shouldn't look at how they evolve over time. I mean, I think you could, I could, I would argue that, that what I have here is a very simple, feeble attempt at having some kind of endogenous evolution of norms. Um, what I object to in the Lucas quote was just this idea that, that of course, institutions and, uh, and uh, structures uh, adopt directly so that they fit the preferences that seem to be God given, and then we just get the the, the institutions that would that would facilitate uh, achieving the the optimum, um, well, which I think is the spirit of Lucas. I don't agree with anything Lucas said. It was just the oh, okay. line that got, got up my nose. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, maybe I, I misunderstood you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stan, um, um, on the uncertainty, I mean, I, I, I certainly would not disagree that, that, that uncertainty is, uh, is a, um, an important fact of life and also what Keynes would call fundamental uncertainty um, rather than just risk. And in fact, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring that up at all here, but I think it becomes very important um, in uh, when discussing, um, say, uh, financial crisis, uh, Minsky-type stories are all about uh, about uh, uncertainty and how how you can always think that this time it's different because things have changed. I mean, in the in the 1990s we had the uh, the dot-com boom and everybody agreed that oh well, but life is different now and and uh, and uh, like well, in, in the early 2000s, during the housing boom, uh, we had Greenspan uh, uh, talking about how really this was much safer than we thought because we'd had all this financial innovation and and now um, what might have seemed unsafe was was no longer unsafe. So so uh, yes, fundamental uncertainty is 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 pretty important for. For the story I'm telling, both in terms of the instability that may arise in the financial sphere, but also in terms of in terms of say even something like like uh, household saving for retirement, um, there's just fundamental uncertainty. You cannot just learn from what your parents did because because circumstances are different. You have different uh, um, a different social security system. You have different family structures. You I mean, just saying oh my parents didn't save enough, I better save more, or vice versa, is not a good rule because of this, of this fundamental uncertainty. Do I see any, anything specific in terms of the relative wage? I'm not sure about that, but this is an area where, where the uncertainty per se is particularly prominent. At least I haven't thought of it. Maybe you have something in mind. Um, and I guess, as a, as a little aside, um, I think we should acknowledge the, the, the fundamental uncertainty. And, and, and in some cases, in some situations, it's, a very, it's very important. On the other hand, I'm sort of reluctant to, um, to put too much emphasis on it. I think sometimes in, in heterodox uh, post-Keynesian circles, it becomes kind of a you can always just appeal to fundamental uncertainty, and 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 then we don't have to talk about about um, about the elements of of goal-oriented behavior that do exist, and and how people try to deal with it, and how people react, and how people behave. Um, it's a fact of life, but it can become um, destructive for any kind of theory if if one emphasizes it too much. Anything can happen. It's all just uncertain. I'm not saying you're doing that. I'm just saying that, that uh, in terms of the the, uh, the relative wage, I hadn't thought of any ways in which fundamental uncertainty 
impacted that particularly. I, I've, I've thought of it much more in relation to financial crisis in Minsky than in relation to, say, uh, retirement saving. Ah, oh, here's a question. Andreas. Andreas. Andreas yeah. Thank you for the talk, Pete. It was absolutely marvelous to learn uh, modern attempts on micro macroeconomics. Um, beside, my question is, beside the problem of aggregation, individual decisions to macro uh, variables, um, how, do you, how do you think that formally we are doing equilibrium economics in terms, as you describe the markets, but the phenomenon you were describing, are they really uh, catched in equilibrium terms. Isn't there something that is out of equilibrium behavior and out of equilibrium terms that you'd have described? Or do you think still that macroeconomics has to do the job as micro is doing in, in formulating the regularities in equilibrium terms? Or do you believe just let me refer to what you have just discussed about fundamental uncertainty. Um, how do you capture fundamental uncertainty in equilibrium terms? And if not, is it more useful uh, to say there might be a tendency to some point of equilibrium, what, what, but what you have described and your story actually are uh, are not equilibrium stories. It, it's it's a way out of equilibrium. Well, but this is a, this is a topic um, beyond from 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 aggregation, really. I I I use uh, the term equilibrium as a a purely uh, any any theory. If any theory that, 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 that is logically consistent has some outcome associated with it. It predicts certain things. If, you, if you're given the assumptions, there's certain implication. And that, that, that is, I mean, if, if a theory has no implications, if it's inconsistent so nothing can happen, then it's not an interesting theory. The theory says, Given, given my exogenous variables, given my assumptions, it doesn't have to be formalized mathematically, but given, given what I've told you, then there are certain implications. Those implications to me describe the equilibrium. So in that sense, my, my model, my theories describe equilibrium because, because they describe what my assumptions imply. Those are the equilibrium. But equilibrium does not mean that things are necessarily stationary. You have growth equilibria. I have endogenous cycles, but they are the prediction of my theory. So in that sense, they are equilibria. In this particular application, I had uh, I had uh, outcomes that involved a lot of underemployment. It was not it was not a natural outcome. But they are the implications of my theory, and in that sense, they are they are the equilibria associated with my theory. So um, I know people use the term in other in other in other ways, but uh, but I have never actually been able to figure out exactly what is the, the the general definition of equilibrium if it's not something along those lines, because. Uh, equilibrium is being used by other people also to describe stuff that is not stationary, that is not optimal, that is not whatever. So, so what is the what is the uh, the common element if it's not that I have some assumptions, they have implications. Those are the equilibria of my theory. Um, so that that's that's the way I use it. How does uncertainty come into it? Well, if if, if Uncertainty prevents us from from presenting any 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 theory. Then then there are no equilibria. But if we say, okay, in this environment, we assume people are going to behave in certain ways and react in certain ways, and then you trace out what are the implications. Then the fact that there was uncertainty in the assumptions 
it does not actually mean that you have no equilibria. It just it just means that the equilibria you get would be influenced by the way that you've chosen to view the effects of of uh, uncertainty. I don't know if that makes sense, but that that's the way I look at it. And I know that other people may have other views of on on what is equilibrium. And um, yeah, mm. on aggregation, you brought that up. Um, I mean, any any macro economic theory, I would say any economic theory for that matter, uh, is probably going to engage in some in some uh, uh, aggregation. Certainly, macro does. And so, I'm not I'm not objecting to DSGE models just because they aggregate. I mean, I aggregate too. Um, but but uh, what I'm objecting to is the particular way in which they aggregate, the particular assumptions they make. Um, so I don't know where you were going with the aggregation, but but um, but that would be my take on that. Yeah. Um, on equilibrium, of course. I mean, you come from uh, microeconomics, and microeconomics. There is a equilibrium has to do with decision making, you know, or mesh equilibrium, for instance, and so you know. And that in macro, my understanding was, you know, uh, the model has to be consistent first of all, you know. I mean the equations, you know, and then if there's equality there to the left and right, then we have an equilibrium. Whereas being a microeconomist, you always ask, you know. Is there a way that somebody can deviate or all kind of things, you know? And it's also without game theory. If you look at uh, duopoly theory, you know, then of course, you I mean, to have a um, Cournot equilibrium, you know, then of course, it's uh, it's on decision making. You know? oh, so it's consistent. You have to do something together, this micro and macro, but it's it's quite different, you know, this equilibrium notion actually. True. Mm -hmm. But does that not just reflect differences in the assumption? Isn't it still, I mean, the micro story makes assumptions about the preferences, yeah. and whatever, and then you say, given these assumptions, this is my prediction, right? The Nash equilibria are these possible outcomes that are consistent with, with my, my story. Um, and, and in some sense, I mean, macroeconomists or other theory producers do the same they say here are some assumptions and uh, and uh, these assumptions lead to the following conclusions and and in economics we tend to call those conclusions for the equilibria associated with the theory yeah but in microeconomics we very often have a multitude of equilibria and then we're just very happy to see how complex or complicated the world is you know <laughs> Just think about this trivial chicken game, you know. I, mean. I had infinitely many equilibria in this story, right? depending on on <laughs> uh, on uh, on uh, the the inflation targets being set. You would get different trajectories for the economy. So yeah. in that sense, uh, the the multiple equilibria I don't think is uh, is uh, a microeconomic monopoly. I mean. Uh, you can well, have macro theories with uh, with multiple equilibria. Yeah, but isn't it depending then in this case, you know, on the on an exogenous uh, variation? I mean, it, it, if you say how it is set, you know, okay, you can I mean, also once have, it is have fixed, you know, then you, you get an equilibrium, eh? a particular one. No, yeah, it's it's not the same. So if you okay. abstract from the monopoly and if you abstract from perfect competition, then in general, you know, we uh, we have to do with many equilibria, isn't it? Or not in a business dilemma, but okay. No, it's just a tip. I think it's a different notion, really, because my face diagram had two equilibria. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> just two different. <laughs> oh, and, and Scott left us now. Okay. <laughs> No, but there's another hand uh, raped. I can't see the name. Who is it? Daniel Eckert. Daniel yeah, Eckert is. Daniel. Mm -hmm. Hi. I think there is an easy lackmus test for the use of the concept of equilibrium. If you can give um, uh, a refinement 
of an equilibrium, then um, it's uh, the microeconomic way or the game theoretic way to deal with this concept. If you can't do that, then the concept doesn't apply. It's mm. just a prediction in your case. Yeah. Well, I don't trust refinements, you know, really. <laughs> I mean, because you need extra assumptions. Think about sequential equilibrium, you know. Then you have to introduce beliefs, you know, which are consistent with your strategy choices. And this is a full construction, you know, because you can construct something like that. But I don't think it makes any empirical sense, you know, this uh, sequential equilibrium. And it's not the it meaning. Also, yeah. It's not, not the meaning. It was there was a kind of um, problem, you know, and uh, this refinement, and then we will go on and go on till we have one equilibrium sort of sorted. But even in sequential equilibria, you get in general, depending on the beliefs you assume, you know, on the structure of the beliefs, you get a lot of equilibrium, an infinite number, of course. Isn't it? So then it would also be exogenous. Yeah, of course it's exogenous. Then mm. it's the same what what we what I just argued with macroeconomics. <laughs> so I'm inconsistent. I'm out of equilibrium. Can I can I ask a follow up to Peter? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, I would refer to the discussion of equilibria again in in micro in game theory we do have equilibrium points that are very different uh, in their properties concerning stability um, and you mentioned in your in your uh, talk the term that there might be a situation uh, created with great volatility so actually in terms your your discussion or your theory uh, relies also on different uh, properties of these equilibria. Do you consider the stability aspects um, as, as in my former uh, years, I studied Harrod's uh, knife edge equilibria. So there, there might be different types of equilibria uh, so that you can refer actually to the different types of situations where it is very dangerous to run into because they are not a stable equilibrium but a very unstable one. Is that true for your theory as well? Absolutely. I mean, and I, I mentioned that, that, uh, that uh, oh, I'm not going to go back to, but, but I mentioned that, that, that part of the book is, is about macro dynamics and about endogenous cycles. And they arise yes. precisely from, from um, basically Herodian instability of the stationary point. Yes. And then you have nonlinearities for various reasons I won't talk about here, that then turns it into, into cycles. But I mean, going back to, I mean, my, 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 simple, my simple little story here had in this phase diagram had two stationary points. So that's two stationary exactly. equilibria if you want. And one of them is unstable and one of them is locally stable, but only locally stable. So if you move far away, you may, if you get a big shock, you may, you may end up diverging. So, so this is an example of multiple equilibria and an example of, of uh, stability issues. In my terminology, though, this even this divergent path would be the one predicted by the theory, and as such, it would be the equilibrium associated with the with the theory. Uh, I don't see equilibrium as necessarily being being associated with something that's converging, or you can have equilibrium cycles. You can have equilibrium is just whatever your theory predicts. You put in assumptions, and they can be they can be restrictive or non-restrictive. You make a prediction based on that. That's what your theory says would happen if these assumptions are fulfilled. And then, of course, the real question is: uh, does does uh, does this theory do these assumptions and this prediction actually match reality? Uh, do we have any any? I mean, is it an interesting story? We can tell lots of stories that are logically consistent. 
but not all of them are particularly interesting. Um, we are usually motivated by some real world issues and um, and so it's incumbent on us to also then try to justify that the assumptions we've made are, are relevant for the issue that we are interested in. Um, and sure. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So the audience is shrinking already. <laughs> a lot of people left because of the time, I guess, but it's very, very interesting this discussion. <clears throat> so, yeah, probably if we are anyway only a few people at the end, I would have um, a question which might be probably uh, naive or stupid because, you know, I, I'm not an economist and just a mathematician, but very, very interested in all those things. And, what I'm wondering all the time is I hear all the time those macro models and hear something about wages and employment and unemployment and all those figures you use for your models. And I'm wondering if in these times of entering into an age of artificial intelligence even and uh, those, those productivities probably not coming from labor or even coming from human beings, I'm sure that, that those discussions uh, have been uh, must have been among economists also in times when industrial revolution came, came up. But and now, where is in your models probably placed for something like I would call it a rate of sharing, sharing of incomes between people who probably just want to live from the productivity of the automatisms that the society brought up with all those brilliant ideas of artificial intelligence or whatever. So. Um, uh, let me make it a little bit more precise, my thoughts. Probably it's completely stu uh, uh, stupid, but when I hear wage, I'm not sure. For me, wage has two functions. And is it probably something that is uh, just economists and Marcos are used to identify wage with both, and you could probably separate it, but isn't wage at a time both on the one hand side, the return from labor, so to say, what someone gets as wage for his productivity. And on the other hand side, it's what he is, uh, what, what makes him have a budget for his daily cons consumption and so on. Of course, he can decide on whether he wants to save it or wants to consume immediately. And if he saves it, he probably aggregates the capital and invests and gets return from capital. And this is a kind of other kind of income. This is all in your models, I guess. But isn't, isn't it that we enter into a world where, where people should probably be able to have a good life in our society, even, even if they just participate from the productivity of, of uh, automatisms that came up? And, and is it about that he then has to have invested into such a firm that applies uh, those automatisms? Or is it already just in participating in the society that someone should be able to have a, I mean, it's probably uh, a, a, a bad word, but in, in German we have this discussion about the sicheres Grundeinkommen. I don't know the English expression about it, but I think it goes into this direction. So this would be, would this be in your models also somehow? Is there a place for such a, an idea of sharing incomes, even by the state, if it would be the secure basic income? Or, or how is, is this in your models? Reflected. Well, the short answer is that uh, it is not in the model at the moment. I did not have any any basic income being distributed to everybody uh, in in this model, and I think descriptively that is not what is happening in India or in most development economies. So this is this is not a uh, this is a model about how how. Uh, in a very stylized way, uh, do I think we should understand the existing developing economies? I mean, when you raise questions about um, what is happening over time, if I understood you correctly, with artificial intelligence and in general kind of machines taking over and maybe humans not being needed, uh, mm -hmm. and of course that that raises uh, that raises issues, and they are primarily of uh, distributional kind because I mean in some ways that's wonderful if we can have if we could have uh, uh, machines uh, uh, doing doing a lot of the of the uh, hard work uh, 
that at the moment uh, human beings have to do, then wonderful. But of course, we would like to uh, make sure that the the fruits of that are distributed um, across society. Uh, I'm not a great fan of 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 the basic income story. I think I think if you wanted to to uh, give a basic income, at least for now, I mean, what's happening 50 years from now, I don't know, but for now, I'm not a great fan of it. If we wanted to give a basic income to everybody, a basic income that's sufficiently large, but is actually something that you can live on, then it's a lot of resources that you need to put into that. And I don't see how you would then maintain at the same time what you could call a social safety net, because some people get ill and they cannot work, they cannot supplement. Uh, some people have uh, other problems, some people, I mean, so so if we want to address uh, a lot of the, of the important issues, sort of insurance type issues, if you want, then it seems to me that it's a bit of a maybe misallocation to give everybody a basic income grant. The same way I thought it was in, in, in economic terms, politically it may have made sense, but I thought in economic terms, it was a, a terrible misallocation when in the US, um, as a response to COVID, they, uh, they gave all of these stimulus checks sent out to everybody pretty much, right? So people who had not suffered anything from COVID, they had not lost their job, they were sitting at home working from, on their computer and they got a stimulus check for $1,400 and they didn't need it. They were just, I mean, I could see that there was a political reason for doing it. And I can see the kind of appeal of a basic basic income uh, for everybody, but I um, I don't think that's the way to go. I would I would probably be in favor of, of at least for now, 50 years from now, if machines had taken over completely, it's a different matter. But, uh, but for now, I'd be in favor of a, a, a relatively developed uh, welfare state and, uh, and uh, that steps in when people need it. And then uh, also a, uh, an active labor market policy to, to people lose their jobs, they can, they can get retraining and whatever, and they can. And of course, there's even a bit of a kind of gray area between between some of these things, because if, if, if de facto you guarantee a certain income, even though you don't give everybody just indiscriminately a basic income, but you, you through the welfare state guarantee that, that basic income to everybody, then so, um, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not perhaps in the final uh, outcome that dissimilar, but it's just without the kind of waste of giving everybody uh, a stimulus check. <laughs> Let yeah. me rephrase my question because I'm also not a fan of the basic income. I'm completely oh. with you that the basic income must be a completely unfair and unproductive allocation at the end. Mm -hmm. But I just try to imagine how can we come to a society where automatisms, yeah, and this artificial intelligence is a new dimension of automatism where machines can produce the productivity and uncouple it from the incomes of the people yeah and just try not to imagine it as a basic income given by the state or so but mm -hmm. after we uncouple it how can we model such a society in such an economy and of course how can we then allocate it on a fair way and still with incentives that people should still uh, contribute <clears throat> to uh, still it so the uh, productivity will not work by itself completely yeah we will ever need some managers and some people who who control this artificial artificial intelligence and everything yeah so it, it it's very hard to imagine that, that uh, the human beings will be completely separated from this production part yeah but but you have to start to uncouple probably the, the income part of wage and the outcome part of wage you know what i mean and then yeah so the basic income is only the only idea we have up to now and this is stupid that's i'm with you yeah but Probably there are better ideas to 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 model and, and to find ways into such a such a new world. I think once once we have sufficient machines, 
but they can cover all our needs. When basically a lot of the traditional economic problems are gone, right? Then, then it's a matter of, I mean, making making use of this this productive capacity to ensure that everybody has a good life. If we don't have enough machines to cover more than the the uh, the uh, the needs of a small group, then of course we still have the. Uh, uh, the conflict, and then it becomes a matter of uh, how do we um, create more machines? How do we uh, make sure that that other people also get uh, get to uh, to share in this? And uh, until that happens, I mean, we probably will find that we'll need some some human labor. Um, but of course, the distributional and uh, the distributional question is then back in, uh, in full force. I think there's a danger in general of exaggerating what has been happening with 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 productivity and, and machines and all that. If you look at, at the, um, the 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 trend in labor productivity, then labor productivity actually rose in in, in the rich countries much faster in earlier periods than it has done uh, in in the last uh, 30 40 years. Uh, we may we may think that oh all of this um, this uh, IT and uh, I don't know now nano whatever this that or the other that this is this is uh, changing everything and it seems much faster than in the past but um, some of it may not be that significant I mean like the latest smartphone may be slightly better than the previous one, but compared to the invention of electricity or antibiotics or or uh, a lot of earlier stuff that really changed people's the car, the mobility, uh, compared to those changes, it's relatively minimal. I mean, who cares? I mean. We may get used to sharper pictures, but does it actually, in some sense, um, improve our life an awful lot that the camera has uh, has some more whatever pixels or more something. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean I I think these are interesting questions and they could well become uh, very important questions at a later date. But right now I don't see them as as top of the agenda. If one mm -hmm. is uh, whether one is talking what's happening in in contemporary US and increasing inequality there, or one is talking what should be done in Brazil, how should they deal with the commodity boom, then yeah. they yeah. seem quite uh, quite remote. Um, yeah. okay. <clears throat> cool, thank you, Francis. Yeah, someone else still? Yeah, right. Anyway, oh. or small group still, so Manfred. No, well, we could go on discussing up to midnight. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be long before before I'd be the only one sitting here. I can. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I mean, there is a lot of. I mean, I could have a lot of arguments or not, and so, for instance, about I don't believe in this machine story because there's already now there's a demand for well, let's say man-made, human-made products. You know. People mm. develop this, and if they say, "Well, I want to have shoes which are handmade," you know, mm. there might be a market for that. And this is, you cannot make a handmade shoe uh, by machines. So mm. there could well be, you know, that uh, whatever the machines deliver, you know, there's a big, big market where machines cannot help us, mm. uh, unless, you know, in 50 years probably the machines want to have man-made shoes <laughs> so it's a turn around but that's a different story uh which i think you know this is something we can look forward i mean we have to consider that machines develop needs and preferences mm -hmm. but this is in your 50 years and not, hopefully not now you know but okay um you know it was really great to see you and to have your discussion mm -hmm. Is Andreas wants to ah uh, he wants to clap hands with one hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. cool. so, so wonderful yeah, no and, well, thanks uh, thanks for inviting me I've I've enjoyed it I mean it's uh, it's I yeah. it was a fun discussion it's always it's always nice to hear yourself speak anyway. <laughs>
thank, oh, thank you very much. Do it, yes. Do it more often. Thank you. you so see we, you next yeah, week, hopefully. Next week, okay, yeah. yes. Yes. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.